All right. Hello. Welcome all to the Community Project Grants webinar. I see people are flowing in. So that is so great. We're very, very happy to have you here with us today. See a few familiar names coming through in the attendees. Great. So lovely to see you all. So we will go ahead and get started a slow open for people who are just tuning in and signing into the webinar. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Lindsay Morrison. I am the grants director here at Florida Humanities. I am joined by my colleague, our grants coordinator, Stephanie Chill. So she and I will be administering the webinar today. This is a live webinar. So we are, are tuning in and speaking to you live and um, how webinars work. You probably know this at this point, you can see us, um, but we cannot see you or hear you. We can just see your name in the attendee list. Um, so as we are going through, if you have a question, because like all webinars, there will be a question and answer at the very end, um, go ahead and type it in to the space that has the two uh, conversation bubbles and it says Q and A that's where you will put your questions. You could also put it in chat, but we would prefer you put it all of your questions as we're going through in the Q&A. And uh, Stephanie will be assisting me in asking the questions live so you can hear what questions are being asked. Um, and then I will be addressing them and she'll be addressing them as well. So that being said, um, we're going to hold all questions until the very end so I can just flow through the presentation and um, we can get you guys uh, hopefully out here by 11 or 11.15. So with that, oh, and I should also mention too, this webinar is being recorded and I will be sending the recording to all who registered for this uh, event. So if you have to sign off for an emergency or for another obligation, um, don't worry, the re entire recorded webinar will be sent to you. All right, now I'm gonna start, stop my video and let's begin. So in this webinar, what is being covered? So for the first part, since we have a lot of new, uh, new faces and new names for this, uh, for this session, I wanted to give a little overview of who Florida Humanities is, as well as an overview of the Community Project Grants Program. Um, you know, and I, I like to give that, that kind of preface and um, to a little bit spend some time describing what the humanities are uh, in terms of how Florida Humanities define it, as well as what is the definition of public humanities programming. So if that is a little nebulous for you, don't worry, we'll spend a little bit of time going over that today before we dive right into the application and um, we will go over some examples of successful narrative, successful budget. I will cover cost share. So that will all be included within the next hour. And then I'll just mention briefly another funding opportunity that we have if your organization is interested. And then we'll answer um, some questions at the very end. So who is Florida Humanities? Florida Humanities is the statewide affiliate in Florida for the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is based in Washington, DC. Every state actually has a humanities council. So Georgia has one, New Hampshire has one, and we are Florida's. So we are a not-for-profit organization. Uh, we have a board of directors. We have a staff of about 10 people. Um, Stephanie and I are, are the grants department. And the funding for this opportunity comes from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So it's federal funding that is provided to us, that is granted to us, that we then re-grant out across Florida to promote other organizations, public humanities programming to really just drive and push the humanities in Florida. So as it says here, our mission is to preserve, promote, and share the history literature, culture, and personal stories that offer Floridians a better understanding of themselves, their communities, and their state. So what exactly are the humanities? Well, the humanities encompass a broad swath of disciplines. As some of you may know, it includes history, literature, poetry, religious studies, philosophy, anthropology. Um, so it can be kind of broad, right? And it covers a lot of different disciplines. But a lot of people, you know, when they look at these disciplines, they think the humanities perhaps is more this guy, right? Plato, Aristotle, you know, people who existed a long time ago and had these great theories, but what are the practical implications for the humanities today? Well, in its essence, the humanities is really the process of pursuing an understanding of our shared human experience. 
And it's through the exploration of the humanities. So diving into those humanities disciplines that we saw that we can learn how to think creatively and critically to reason and to ask questions. So what is public humanities programming then? And this is an important distinction because yes, we fund the humanities, but community project grants specifically fund public humanities programming, which of course is active learning experiences for the public that draw upon the methods and insights of the humanities and foster a greater understanding among people and invite thoughtful reflection. So here the key points are, does your programming engage the public, direct engagement, and does it foster constructive dialogue that brings that you know, proverbial light bulb above people's heads, that aha moment, um, that is typical characteristic of the humanities to make sure you are hitting the mark. So let's dive into community project grants, the specific funding opportunity that we are chatting about today. Community project grants at this time offer up to $5,000 to support your organization's public humanities programming. Um, now this grant program is our most a locally driven program. That means that we fund the projects that come forth to us from our uh, nonprofits across the state. That being said, all programming that we fund must hit on a few marks, like a lot of grant makers. So all projects must involve humanities scholars as either advisors or presenters in the actual project. Um, all projects must engage the general public. So they can't just be just for your specific network or your constituency or you know, a very limited audience. They must be open and available for the general public. And also all programming must be free or not cost prohibitive. And what we see as cost prohibitive is can a family of four attend this event for around you know, 15 to $20 tops. Um, you know, if we see an individual event costing one singular person $20, um, we would consider that cost prohibitive. And the reason is because we want to make sure that the humanities programming that we fund is open and available to a large group of people who may not have the socioeconomic means to attend you know, humanities programming elsewhere. We want to make our programming accessible to all. So who is eligible to apply for this funding? As it says in the guidelines, community project grants are open to nonprofit organizations, local municipalities, and cultural, civic, and educational entities. So if you are a nonprofit in Florida, um, or you are associated with a city, you are a library, a historical society, you are eligible to apply for this grant. Now, if you already have a community project grant, and this is important to note because you have to first close out your currently open grant before you can apply for a new one. In other words, you can only hold one open community project grant at a time. Now, of course, you probably know there are other funding opportunities that Florida Humanities offers. Perhaps you applied for Florida Humanities American Rescue Plan grant, ARP. So if you are awarded that grant, when those uh, funding decisions are announced later, um, can you receive community project grant? The answer is yes. You can hold an American Rescue Plan grant from Florida Humanities and a community project grant at the same time. The important distinction, however, is that funds cannot overlap between the two. Um, you may know that ARP, American Rescue Plan, funds general operating support. Community project grants do not. They support public humanities programming. So also we have Greater Good Humanities and Academia. So if you are a university or a college department, uh, you can apply for Greater Good and also apply for community project grants. Uh, the important distinction there is that you can't double dip in the programming. Both those grants can't be requested to fund the same project. They have to fund different projects. So here are some examples of public humanities programming that we fund. Um, I just draw out some of the most uh, common ones that we see, but of course we fund other types of programming as well. So some of the buckets are first lectures, forums, and podcasts. Casts. Now, before the coronavirus pandemic, we funded a lot of in-person lectures and um, conversations that happened face-to-face. -face. But as everything is moving to virtual, we're, we are seeing a large amount 
of applicants seeking funding for podcasts, for Zoom lectures, um, you know, and you can have request funding for either one big name speaker. Maybe that person has a large honoraria, you know, two thousand, five thousand dollars. Um, you know, big name New York author. You can request funding just for that one event, or maybe you want to bring in a series of humanity scholars or authors or presenters, and have you know ten different programs across three or four months. We weigh those equally. We do not give one more preference or the other. It really depends on the impact your project is going to make um, and how grounded it is in the humanities. So another type of programming that we fund is outdoor heritage signage exhibits with public programming. So if you wanted to put some outdoor heritage signage outside of your museum, um, you know, talking about a specific subject that's grounded in the humanities, maybe you want to raise up underrepresented stories we could fund the creation of those outdoor heritage panels, as well as indoor exhibits. If you wanted to bring an exhibit to your historical society or library, we could fund the creation of that. The important note about outdoor heritage signage and exhibits is that there must be that element of public engagement. So we can't just support the creation of an exhibit or the creation of an outdoor heritage sign if it doesn't have, for example, a uh, panel discussion, you're bringing an author on site, or you're going to have a lecture series online um, to really dive into the topics that you are presenting in those exhibits um, and engaging with the public in a question and answer, that dialogue that we talked about with, with public programming. So the third example is oral history projects. We see these come through a lot and we love funding the story collection, you know, harvesting histories from people um, to capture a moment in time. And with exhibits, similar to exhibits and outdoor heritage signage, there must be an element of public humanities programming to go along with the oral histories. So for example, we can't simply fund the collection of oral histories. Um, what we would need to see is how you are presenting those collected stories to the general public. So perhaps you are hosting a Zoom conversation, you're bringing in you know, one of the, the folks that you collect oral history from, or perhaps a representative of them, and you're engaging the public in those themes. So fourth are community conversations and dialogues. Perhaps you'd like to gather the community together, bring in a humanity scholar to present the context, to set the context for the conversation. Then you divide people into groups and have a conversation and come back together. So we fund those types of programming as well. And then finally, reading and discussion groups or film screenings and discussion or panel discussions. Um, so we fund a lot of uh, reading programs at libraries where they're bringing in an author to talk about perhaps a book that is grounded in Florida history, heritage, and culture, and then fostering that dialogue um, or a film screening and then fostering a dialogue after that. Um, so again, throughout all of these examples, there's that active engagement with the public um, and they're all grounded in the humanities. Now, what are some projects that we cannot support? Um, here I've pulled out four that are the most common types of things that we see that we cannot fund. Uh, one would be art and performing art projects. And that is the difference between um, the arts and the humanities, because you may know there is the National Endowment for the Arts and then the National Endowment for the Humanities. And the Florida Humanities is an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we fund that active engagement, that conversation, that dialogue that is grounded in interpretation and analysis, um, we would not be able to fund, you know, operas, plays, um, you know, the painting of a mural or, you know, an art exhibit that is just a plain art exhibit. However, there can be a marriage between the arts and the humanities. For example, if you are, you have a theater program and you would like to bring in a humanities scholar afterwards to engage the public in the humanities disciplines that were brought forth from the theatrical performance, you can uh, request funding to support those humanity scholars, um, as well as promotion for the panel discussion um, and other sorts of nature like that. Next is social service projects. Um, there's sometimes uh, confusion between humanitarian efforts and the humanities. Um, the humanities is that analysis and interpretation, that involvement with a humanity scholar um, and grounding in those disciplines that we saw in the beginning of this presentation. 
Next is creative or scholarly research with no public engagement. So unfortunately, you know, the project that you have may be rooted in the humanities. For example, you want to bring in a historical contractor to dive in the history of a certain topic and then come out with um, a, a plan or a manuscript afterwards. If there's no public engagement and it's just a collection of scholarly research, that would not unfortunately count as public humanities programming and it would not be eligible for funding through community project grants. Lastly, um, projects without all the details. Say, for example, you have a humanities pro program that you'd like funding, like a lecture series, but you're not quite sure who you would like to bring in to speak or what that individual would be speaking about, but you would just need funding for just a speaker's program next year. Um, unfortunately, we cannot provide funding without knowing who you're bringing in, you know, who those funds would be directed to, so we can make sure they are a qualified presenter and their topic is rooted in the humanities. So make sure you um, have all those details and hold off on applying until you have all the, the information in place. That being said, I will note, um, you do not have to have the exact date of your presentation. You know, you can say, I would like to bring in Dr. Smith to talk about um, the history of this certain community, and they're going to be presenting in February of 2022. That is allowable. So next, let's go over some examples of successful community project grants. So here is one from the Polk Museum of Art. They were awarded $5,000 a couple of years ago to support the project Art and Social Justice, Legacy of the Freedom Writers. So this was a really great example of how the art can be merged with the humanities and Florida Humanities has come in to support that humanities, that public humanities component. So the Polk Museum of Art hosted an exhibit called an art exhibit, Art and Social Justice, Legacy of the Freedom Writers, where an artist portrayed individuals who were arrested um, during the civil rights movement and during the freedom rides. And so they brought in a PBS film, um, they brought in uh, also humanities scholars, people who actually participated um, in the, this movement to an auditorium at the Polk County Museum. And we funded the honoraria for those scholars, for those subject area experts, their participants that they brought in who had firsthand experience. So we funded their honoraria, their stipend, as well as publicity and promotion to get this out to the local community. Um, so this was a great example of how the art can be merged with the humanities and we fund that public humanities component. Now there is a one-to-one -one cost share, which we will get into later, um, but I should mention here that their actual art exhibit itself, they used the, to uh, record as cost share. So we did not provide funding for the art side of it. We just funded the humanity side of it, but they were able to record that artistic exhibit as cost share. So the next grant I wanted to provide as an example is from Safardi Voices. They were awarded $1,600 to support legacies of the Spanish Inquisitions, Florida's Converso and Sephardi Jews in conversation. So this was during the pandemic and they had to um, change their, their format a little bit, which was turned out to be excellent. They truly did a great program, just closed it out. And um, they hosted two Zoom conversations to dive into the themes that were collected from oral histories um, that their organization worked to harvest the year prior. So they applied for funding at the tail end of their oral history project to bring in funding to support humanity scholars engaging directly with the general public. So, and our funds directly went to um, some of the Zoom costs as well as the honoraria for the scholars and publicity and promotion. Um, you'll also note here that they didn't request the full 5,000 and that is allowable. You can request the funding and you should only request the funding that you need to complete your program. Um, and we don't weigh those differently. We don't weigh people who um, apply for $5,000 higher than people who apply for less. Uh, it's truly just um, the information that you have, the impact you're going to have in the community and how grounded it is in the humanities. So here are some slides from this project. Um, you can see here they, they interviewed folks at oral history projects and then they presented them to the public. So let's dive into who qualifies as a humanities scholar. This is a question that we get quite often from our applicants. So we'd like to address it here in the webinar for all um, because humanities scholars, as you saw earlier, 
are required as part of community project grants. So we classify humanity scholars as an individual with a high level of expertise and experience in humanities discipline, or is actively engaged in researching or programming in that field. So humanities scholars do not have to come from an academic university or college setting. They can be found outside of that. Maybe they are authors of books. Um, you know, perhaps they've conducted research in the field for the past 10 or 15 years, and they're extremely qualified. Perhaps they are also um, the executive director of a local historical society or, um, you know, of a similar nature or, or the executive director of a cultural organization that has a firm grounding in the humanities. So there needs to be a humanities scholar in the project to act as either a back end advisor, perhaps they're guiding some of the questions that you want to address in a panel discussion, or they're actively participating. They are your presenter in a zoom conversation or they are participating on a panel itself. Uh, we just need to see that a humanities scholar is present. We also encourage you to reach out to subject area experts and community experts, because it's really bringing in multiple scholars, multiple experts that come to the humanities theme or topic from multiple angles that produces great programming. So when is the deadline? The deadline is coming up in uh, less than a month now. It is on October the 12th, 2021 at noon. All of our deadlines are at 12 p.m. noon, so make sure you do get it in before then. Um, and if you apply by October the 12th, you'll be notified of your funding that's either denied or approved on December 1st, 2021. So there is a rather quick turnaround if you're familiar with applying for um, some other state or federal grants. We try to get the funding out to communities as soon as possible so that you're able to hit the ground running and um, pay the presenters and scholars that you need to. So for the October 12th deadline, um, that would fund public programs that start on January 12th, 2022, going until December 1st, 2022. Um, the reason there is a six week gap, you'll see there between the contract start date of December 1st and the first date that your public event, your public program can start, is there's a six week buffer to allow you to sign the contract agreement for you to request the initial funding for your grant um, and to also get that public event up on our online events calendar, which is required for all public events. So that's why we have that six week buffer period. So while we do get these grants out quickly in communities, there is just a little bit of a lead time that you have to figure out and work into your, your actual project schedule. So there will be 2022 deadlines, they are coming soon uh, in the next month. There will be four deadlines next year. The next one will be in January. Um, and the January deadline will fund projects uh, that, or the, the grant period for the January deadline will be March 1st, 2022 until March 1st, 2023. Now for the January deadline, if you have a public program in mind that you want to begin after April the 12th, that is that six week buffer period between March 1 and six weeks after that would be April 12th, you can wait and apply in January. You can you know, gather all this information now, hold off, you know, have conversations with me, we can schedule a Zoom call, and then you actually submit your deadline for that, your application for that January deadline. Um, and I encourage you to do that if you can, if your public programs do not start until mid-April or beyond, because I can tease here that we are going to be likely increasing the funding for community project grants. Um, so if you can wait and apply the July deadline, uh, you could be eligible for more funding. However, um, October 12th can support programs that are from January uh, through April and then on beyond until December 1st. Uh, and that award amount again is up to $5,000. So let's look a little bit at the grant cycle. Um, so for community project grant, these are one year grants, as you saw on the previous slide. So if you apply October the 12th, there is a review period on our end where an evaluation panel will review all the grants that are submitted. Um, they are weighed against a rubric that every single grant goes before. Um, and the panel is made up of a diverse representation of staff, uh, Florida Humanities Board members sometimes, as well as external, external scholars. Um, we really made a great effort in the past couple of years to diversify and increase the scholarship that we had on our evaluation panel. So we're very, very pleased and proud of that. So if you apply October the 12th, you will find out December the 1st. 
if you are approved or denied. Um, if you are approved, you have one year to complete the grant and you can request 90% of your funding up front. Um, so that is if you request $5,000 from community project grants who are awarded that, you can then ask for $4,500 in the first cash request. Um, and again, you have to submit an event listing form for every public event that you have. So if you have five events, you'll be submitting five event listing forms to get them up on our website that we will then cross promote for you through our newsletter, through our social media, as well as try to attend ourselves um, if it is safe to do so. And after the, your event has ended, your series of events has ended, or after your contract period has ended, you will go back into the online portal where you had submitted your application and you will fill out the final report. And that's also where you will request the final 10% of your funding um, as a reimbursement. So again, you can ask for 90% of your funding upfront. The final 10% will be held uh, to make sure your, your grant was in good standing and then it'll be released to you. So if you are denied, um, first, don't get discouraged. Uh, the funding you know, ratio, it, it happens sometimes that way. Perhaps you're just missing a few elements. Um, you know, perhaps you didn't have all the details or it wasn't quite hitting the mark for the evaluation panel. What you're gonna do is reach back out to me and seek those evaluation comments. Uh, we are very happy to provide that because our evaluation panel, we require them to provide substantial comments on each item that they are evaluating on so that you can know how you can approve your grant for the future if you're applying for Florida Humanities, or you can take those comments as a learning experience for when you're applying for other opportunities for that project. So what are the steps to apply? First, you're going to brainstorm your project, um, determine what you want to do, uh, what goals you want to meet, how it is rooted in the humanities. Then you're going to reach out to us. Um, we highly encourage you to um, send a detailed description about what you want to do so that we can read that over, think about it, and then provide um, feedback to see if you, know, you can improve in a certain area or um, you know, add a certain component, maybe add a humanities scholar to, to beef that up a little bit. But we're also happy to do pre-reviews of your application. Um, if you're particularly concerned that you're not hitting the mark, uh, please do send that to us. And, um, but unfortunately, we cannot review anything that's submitted uh, the week before the deadline. So if you'd like us to review something, just please do get it to us um, more than a week before the deadline. So once you have everything in order, your I's are dotted, T's are crossed, you're going to apply for funding online, which we will get into with uh, looking at some of the narratives and how to set up an account. And of course, ask questions along the way. And if you're denied, um, do seek comments. Um, we see some applicants fall into the trap of they brainstorm their project, uh, they do not reach out to us, and then they apply for funding. Um, they don't get funding, and then they repeat that process. They just resubmit the same application. Um, and I'm happy to tell you that we do fund all the projects that, that meet that mark uh, for, the, for the evaluation committee. There is rarely a project we do not fund that meets all of our qualifications, but we've just run out of funding. In the three years that I've been here, that's never happened. Um, we provide funding to all projects that hit those standards for, for what the Florida Humanities Community Project Grants fund. So what are the funding chances of funding? Um, right now it hovers around 37%. We have seen an increase when we started Grant Ed about six months ago with these webinars. Um, so we're happy to see that you know, this communication is working and we're able to get you some behind the scenes tips and tricks that make it more likely that you are going to be successful in seeking funding from us because we really see this funding as we are stewards of federal funds that really belong out in communities and are for the people. So we love funding projects. I would love for that funding chance and funding ratio to get up to about 50 or 60 or 70%. Um, we will work there. Um, but the more that people communicate with us in advance and um, you know, submit us proposals, ask questions, read the guidelines, watch the webinar a few times, the higher your chances are to be funded. Now let's dive into some keys to successful applications. So like all grant applications, there are some narratives that you will be asked to answer uh, written out. Um, they can be seen here. Each one of these bullet points is a separate narrative you'll be asked to write. One is the history and mission of your organization. Describe a little bit about what your nonprofit or what your cultural entity is. What kind of programming do you do? What is your reach um, that you normally reach in a singular year or a month 
um, and who are your typical partners? And also do mention if you have partnered with Florida Humanities in the past through a grant or a program. Uh, next is humanities content. This is perhaps the most important narrative in the entire application because it is where you will describe exactly what you are going to be doing with your project um, and how it is rooted in the humanities and how it classifies as public humanities programming. Um, we'll, I'll show you an example successful humanities content narrative so you can see what that looks like. Um, and I'll dive into a few more um, uh, ideas about what we're looking for there. Third is work plan and marketing promotion. Um, those are really two separate elements that you need to address in the narrative. First is a work plan, a month by month work plan about what you're going to do each month to make your project a success. And here we're talking about, you know, when you are going to do promotion, um, you know, when the events are going to be, when are you going to do the surveys and follow-ups um, and planning events, things of that nature. And then marketing and promotion. How are you uh, going to reach out to communities? Um, and how, what is both the qualitative and quantitative data that goes along with the marketing? For example, you are going to um, advertise in the Tampa Bay Times and it costs X amount of dollars to do that. And the, the Tampa Bay Times has a reach of this amount of people. Because what you want to portray in this narrative is how your project is going to have a broad reach both within your community to different subsets of your community as well as across the state of Florida. So fourth is target audience. Who is the audience that you are trying to reach with your project? And here we're also asking about how you are reaching out to underserved communities because we really want you to think deeply and carefully about the people that are not traditionally um, at the table with this humanities programming and involve them in the creation of the project as well as the end result. Also fees, we're gonna ask you what you are charging for the event, um, project personnel, uh, both the people that are working on the project as well as the humanity scholars, advisors, and uh, subject area experts that you are bringing in for the project. And then lastly, impact and evaluation. What is the long-term impact? What is the short-term impact? How are you going to measure success? We do require that you submit um, an evaluation form for how you're going to measure that success of your project. And we ask you to tailor that evaluation form to the specific goals of your programming. So for example, if you are the Polk Museum of Art and you're doing a, a project on legacy of the Freedom Riders, perhaps you are asking direct questions about people's knowledge of the Freedom Rides um, so that you can have you know, before surveys or after surveys or ask people to think deeply about the subject itself rather than just if they enjoyed the presentation. So here are some examples of humanities content. Uh, as you can see here, this applicant was successful and uh, fully describing what they were doing. They organized their narrative into different paragraphs, which made it very easy for the evaluation panel to read and digest. Um, so it was well organized. It was clear and concise. And they also provided a great detail about their project's purpose, what they were intending to do, um, and they laid out specifically the different events they were going to hold, who was going to be a part of each event, what they were going to talk about, um, you know, and, and each of the themes that would be brought forth that makes it public humanities programming. Um, so here, this is very important to do. Now, I've seen a few applicants fall into the pitfall of they use the entire word count, they describe it very well, um, but they spend, you know, 80% of it talking about the history of their topic and only 20% talking about what they will be doing in the project for the next year. Um, so we ask you just to switch that around a little bit, you know, talk about it for about, um, you know, 10 or 20% about the, the history of your subject, but then spend most of the narrative because it is a limited word count or limited character count talking about what you're going to be doing in the next year with awarded funds. So next, uh, let's look at the work plan and marketing and promotion. You can see here, that this applicant divided them out. So they have their work plan, um, what they're going to be doing during their contract period, as well as marketing and promotion. And you can see that they identified specific market, media markets that they are reaching out through. Maybe that is social media. Uh, maybe that is you know through their newsletters, through partner newsletters. And they're talking about how many people are going to be reached out through each of those venues. So they include both qualitative and qual quantitative data. 
Now, here are some examples of unsuccessful narratives. Um, typical, you know, common unsuccessful narratives are a bit on the short side. They don't um, spend a lot of time narratively describing their project, um, or they're, they don't quite, um, they're, they're a little bit challenging to understand. So here, we just encourage you to use all of your word count that is available and think of it as a persuasive writing piece. Um, you really want to persuade the evaluators that your project needs to be funded more than the other ones, or that is going to have a big impact in communities. So now let's talk about budget. Um, so here are the budget lines that we uh, that we ask you to put some numbers by if you have some costs associated with them. We do have a budget form that's downloadable in our online application that you must use. Uh, it is a Word document that you can download, uh, fill out. It's a fill out fill out you know document, fillable document, and then reattach as either a Word doc or a PDF. So we'll see the um, a screenshot of that budget form in just a moment. But as you can see here, you can request funding for honoraria, honoraria for your humanity scholars or for uh, your subject area experts, presenters of that nature, travel per diem and lodging. If you have an in-person event, we can cover the travel of your humanity scholar. Perhaps you're bringing in someone from another state. So we, we could cover their airfare um, or their, um, their gas mileage. We can also cover facilities, equipment, and audiovisual. Perhaps you want to bring in a photographer to um, photograph the event, or a film crew, or a live stream production costs. We can also fund that as well. Or perhaps the facilities, if you're going to rent a space at a local theater or a local library, we can cover those costs with the requested funds. Also publicity and promotion. Um, costs for advertising on Facebook, for placing ads in local newspapers, uh, for creating graphic posters, um, for printing those posters. Those are all things that can be funded. Uh, supplies as well, if you are having a book and lecture series, um, if you would like funds to um, purchase a few copies of the book to give out, um, you can do that. We just ask you to describe what you're gonna be doing with the books afterwards, if they're gonna go out to underserved communities or be given to a library, um, you know, do, do make sure you clarify that. Exhibit design and fabrication, of course, that's where the exhibit costs come in that we can help fund, and then other. If there's other costs that don't fit in there, um, I encourage you to reach out to me if, to see if it can be covered um, before putting it in that, that other line item and submitting your application, but we have that there in case there's something that do not fit into the above buckets. So let's dive into cost share. What is cost share? Well, cost share or match are those costs of a project that are not paid by Florida Humanities through this grant, through these requested funds, but paid instead using resources from within the organization or from outside the organization through other grants or sponsorships. Now we do require a one-to-one -one match for community project grants. That means if you request $5,000, you must show 5,000 in cost share. Um, now that can be, made up of in-kind cost share or cash. So cash cost share would be those actual hard costs. Maybe you have to buy um, five tables as part of your, um, your event. So if you need to buy those five tables and you're not requesting funding for it, that can be recorded as cost share cash. Now cost share in kind is different. And that, that is all um, donated services by your organization or contribution from outside organizations or individuals, such as labor, materials, goods, or services that directly contribute to the project. Now, some examples of in-kind cost share include staff time, volunteer time, um, office space, use of equipment, public program supplies that you are not requesting funding for, um, refreshments um, that you are bringing onto the event, because you'll see in the guidelines, we cannot cover food or beverages with these federal funds, um, but also maybe a scholar is coming in and they are themselves covering their travel, lodging, meals, um, and you're not requesting that through the grant and you're not paying them through another source from your organization. So all of those costs that are associated with the project that are outside that $5,000 that you're requesting for Florida Communities, that would be considered cost share. Now let's dive into a little example of cost share because um, sometimes I know it can be a little bit of an intimidating topic. Um, so I like to break it down into a very simple, simple item here. So the, here's an example of a lemonade stand. Say you are awarded $200 from Florida 
mayonnaise to buy lemons for your lemonade stand. Every other cost associated with your project or the lemonade stand outside of those lemons would be recorded as cost share. So cost share in kind would be perhaps a table that is donated by your neighbor that has a value of around $50. So that would be recorded as in kind cost share. Your mom allows you to print uh, from the printer and that would cost about $20 if you would have paid for it, but it's going to be donated. That is in kind as well as uh, your own time at the table. Um, say you spent 10 hours um, and $15 per hour, um, but you are donating that time to the project. You are not being compensated for it. Um, your time was valued at $150. That could be recorded as in-kind cost share. In cash, maybe, oh shoot, you have a table now, you have lemons, but you don't actually have a lemonade juicer, very important component. And you need to go out and buy one. So your mom gives you $100 cash to go out and buy a lemonade juicer. Now that would be recorded as cash cost share. So the total project budget, including the lemons, including the in-kind and cash is $520. Now you'll want to note that um, you, we do ask that you record all cost share associated with your project if you can. Um, so you will are not encouraged to just look at, you know, $200 to match the $200 that you requested from Florida Communities. Look at all the costs that are associated with your project and record that in the budget. The reason we ask that is that to be fully transparent, we also have to provide a match to the funds that we receive from the NEH. So your match trickles up to us that we can then record as match for our NEH grant which then in, terms, in turn allows us to get more funding down the road through allocations from Congress. So it better helps our chances of helping you if you're able to record all of the cost share associated with your project. So here are some examples of successful budgets. Um, here's a screenshot of the, uh, the budget form that I was talking about a moment ago. So here a successful budget detail includes exact costs about what they're asking for. You can see down here, they are asking for a total of $5,000. And here is what they, is made up of the 5,000. So they're asking for 3,000 for honoraria, 1,295, very precise for travel per diem and lodging, because that's for a couple presenters. And then they're asking for $705 for publicity and promotion. In total, that is 5,000. Now you can see their cash and in kind are divided out between the two. Um, you do not have to be in just one or the other. It can be made up of both and they're not also matching up line item per line item. The important thing is just the total down here, total cost share is at least 5,000. It can be made up of any one of these items though. Oops. So you can see here, they are recording the in-kind, the value of perhaps facilities, equipment, rental, audio, video that is donated to the project as well as donated staff time. Cost share cash, um, you know, perhaps they had to pay 1,080 for to live stream the event that's recorded in cost share. And then um, they had to pay another 1,257 for additional publicity and promotion um, and another 1,000 that was paid out for something else as well as $15 in supplies. So the total of the, those two in kind and cash is the total cost share. Now here is a successful budget detail. So on the budget form, there is a table at the top and then there is budget detail at the bottom and you need to fill out both. And it's very important for evaluators that you are very descriptive in the budget detail. Um, and we'll see a little example of an unsuccessful budget detail, but as you can see here, this successful applicant uh, broke out what they're requesting from Florida Humanities. You can see up there with the red notes, as well as what they're recording as cost share, both in kind and cash. Um, you do not have to color code it. This was great for us to see, but it can just be just bulleted out in detail of this way. So successful budget details in total are clearly organized. They describe all the costs associated with your project. They also list out who is receiving what. So if you're requesting honoraria, um, travel per diem and lodging, they're saying who gets what cost. Publicity and promotion, you can see here they're breaking it down for us as well. And the reason is that as grant makers and grantors, we need to be confident that these dollars, these federal funds that we are fiscally responsible for are going to the places that are all allowable by our grant. So here is an unsuccessful budget. Um, as you can see here, 
uh, they they did ask for costs here, but they're they seem to be more blanket costs, right? They're not quite sure where they're going to be spent, but they just want to put some funds in that bucket. Um, and then they did not describe specifically where those budget costs, where those funds will be going. Um, and in the budget uh, cost share, um, again, they just didn't describe it. They put down, so we're not quite sure how they're coming up with those those dollars, those figures. Um, so we really need to be uh, be very clear and use all the budget detail space to describe the costs that you are both requesting and recording as cost share. So now, uh, before we go into the q and I want to go over, actually, we're looking at the online application. Um, here is another funding opportunity. This is like a little ad in our Community Project Grants webinar. We do have a grant called Florida Talks. Um, the deadline for that is November the 1st, and it funds speakers between January 1 through May 31st, 2022. Now, what is Florida Talks? We have what is called a speakers directory, where we have 53 speakers, and between them all, over 100 different programs that they offer. This grant allows you to apply for up to $1,000 to bring in one, two, or three of those speakers and host program that is already made by the speakers. It's already agreed, but upon you just request funding and say which speakers, which programs you want to present to your audience. Maybe you have just a three speaker series that you want to have at your library and you can request funding for that. The application is very straightforward. It's very simple. Um, so maybe you're not quite ready to take the steps with a community project grant, but you just want to have three engaging Florida centered talks. Look into Florida talks, um, which is available on our website, or you can reach out to me and I can send you the link directly. So now back to our regularly scheduled programming of community project grants. So if you are ready to apply for funding, what are the next steps? First, you're going to apply or uh, submit an, uh, create an account in our online application portal or sign into your organization's existing account. If this is your first time with Florida Humanities and you have never submitted a grant before, um, you are going to create a new account. If your organization has already applied for a grant in the past, you will want to um, apply through that organization's account. If you're not sure if your organization already has an account, reach out to me or to Lisa Lennox, who is seen there um, on the opening page of that online form. And we can let you know and then add you as a contact to that organization account so you can log in and be associated with it that way. So after you log in, you're going to go up here to the very top um, and you're going to click on this apply button. That's going to bring up all the funding opportunities that Florida Humanities currently has available. Um, and once you are ready, you're going to go over here and click apply. Now, I also want to direct you to this button down here, this preview button. If you're not quite ready to submit an application, but you want to look at what questions are going to be asked or pass that on to your supervisor, you can preview the application down here and that will not open up an application yourself. So with that, I am going to start my video again so we can feel like we're having a personal conversation and ask my grants coordinator, Stephanie, to pull out some of the questions that I've asked. I see a few of them have come in, which is great. Yeah, we do. We've got some great questions. Um, let's start with one with, I have a couple of community leaders who they want to involve. I'm not sure if they're humanity scholars. So how do I verify or how do I find humanity scholars to help my program if these people don't count? That's a very good question. So if you are unsure, if your person qualifies as a humanity scholar, reach out to me, um, describe in a few sentences what your project is, what you hope to be doing, and then list those individuals, their name, as well as their uh, where they come from, their qualification. And I can give you feedback if I feel like the, the evaluation committee um, will qualify those as humanity scholars. And where to find them, um, you can look at your local uh, university or college. You know, for example, if you would like a professor of history on a certain topic, go to your local university and um, just reach out to them. We see a lot of, of, you know, scholars and university professors being involved. They love being cued in or being asked because um, it helps them be in tune with what's going on in their local community. And we're also able to compensate them for their time. So um, that is a good thing to look there. You could also do a Google search um, to see who are the experts of your field. Maybe you could reach out to someone who could tune in virtually if they're in another state. So those are a few ways. Um, along a similar line, 
Can the grant be used for um, to pay the speaking fees for humanities professors uh, or other presenters who are participating in the project? So it sounds like can the fees be be used for just humanities scholars or anybody who's speaking at, as part of the project? So the fees can be used for both humanities scholars as well as for subject area experts, community experts, or other participants as well. Um, what we need to just see is if there is a humanities scholar, for example, if it's a panel presentation, you have five people, but only one of them is humanities scholar. We can uh, award funding to all of their honoraria because they're in, they're in conversation with the humanities scholar. However, if you had a panel and there was no humanities scholar on that panel, um, those individuals would likely not qualify to receive funding through our honoraria. Okay. Um, what a community, community poetry project or creation of a municipality's poet lottery pro program be considered humanities or does that fall under arts and performing arts? We do fund poetry projects. Um, poetry, we do classify as a subset and discipline of the humanities. Um, so we fund funded some poetry um, lecture programs, you know, where they're presenting their poem, but the key is that there has to be an element of analysis and interpretation. So perhaps the poet or the poet and an additional humanities scholar are going to be in conversation after the reading so that they can really dive into what it means, what it means for the being of state of Florida, what it means to be a human. Um, so really diving into those themes. When people agree to be part of my project, uh, can I use an email to show that their support or their commitment to the project, or does it have to be an actual signed letter on letterhead or a contract? Good question. Um, so that goes back to you know having all the details in advance of submitting your project. So we do ask that you have your speakers confirmed um, at the time of the application, just so that we know that they've agreed to participate and. The reason is that you know if you want to bring in a big name speaker, we agree to fund them, but you haven't reached out to them and they don't agree to participate. Um, there's going to be a lot of back and forth to try to find a new presenter that fits in with your project. So it's easier to just have them um, verified at the beginning. And their verification that they agree to participate can be included as a supplemental document as either just a screenshot of an email or as a formal letter on letterhead. The important thing for evaluation panel is just to see that they've agreed to participate. So however form that comes in um, is fine with us. We're getting a lot of questions about kind of the involvement, which is great because um, we wanna make sure that all the right people are being um, asked and that we're showing support for that. Is a speaker confirmation the same as a support letter? Can a speaker um, write a letter of support? Well, it depends. If your speaker is writing a letter of support confirming that they're participating, then that would be the same thing. However, you could have a letter of support from a local nonprofit organization um, verifying that they will support promoting your project. Um, so they're not presenting it at all, but they're just going to help cross promote it or they just support it at all. And they want to portray to the evaluation panel that this is a worthy project for the community. So your support letters can be confirmation letters from your presenters that they agree to participate, as well as, you know, um, think of them as reference letters when you're applying for a job. You can apply for or send those along as well with your application. And it could also be um, if you have partners, like community partners who have agreed to promote a program or be involved, they say that they're going to support the project through XYZ. That could be confirmation um, and proof of support. Exactly, yep. Um, along the lines, looking though at cost share, do you have any concerns about seeing salary match as the listed cost share, or do you prefer to see a variety of in-kind cost share, um, such as speakers agreeing to reduce their honorariums or room rentals? Great question. We prefer to see honoraria or cost share coming from many different buckets. Um, if you are just recording your staff salary time as cost share, um, you know, that that can be a little bit tricky, you know, just in case that doesn't meet the entire cost share, you know, there there is always going to be lots of cost share. So with your project that may not come to mind initially, for example, volunteer time or facilities use rentals. So I encourage you to record all of that. Um, I will note there is a 15 percent cap on recording overhead costs as cost share. 
So overhead would be those costs not associated with the direct programming of your project that are like, you know, just the overall salary um, outside of the public programming. So we do put a 15% cap on that. However, you can record your direct staff time fully. If you, if it is recorded as, you know, directly involved with the project, you can record that as cost share associated with the grant. And there is no cap on that. So for example, if you are working, you know, 40 hours on the project, and your um, you know, time would be valued at you know, $35 per hour, record all of that as cost share. But it always helps to record additional sources of cost share as well as salaries directly involved with the project. Okay. Um, back to support letters, how many can be uploaded or how many should be included? Um, there is a size limit on the supplemental documents, so it's more a, uh, a size limit. I think it's two millibytes that's that's on there. Um, and but there is no limit in terms of the supplemental documents. Think about it as just what is the best way to portray that your grant is uh, is a great project that has a lot of community support. Um, you know, maybe that's just one letter from a local community. If your project is more local and that's fine, you're a smaller organization and you just have one other partner that is perfectly fine. Or maybe this is a much larger project and you're able to get, you know, five or six letters of support from local community organizations, include all of those as well. Okay, we have a couple questions related to the use of the funds that are awarded. Um, so can the grant, can grant funds be used to buy objects for an exhibition? No, they can, well, it depends on the object, I suppose. Um, but Typically, the funds can be go towards creating more the the panel, the interpretive the interpretive panels associated with an exhibit. If you're looking at buying art for an art exhibition that has public communities programming, our funds could not be used to directly purchase the art. Um, but if they were other objects that went along with the exhibit itself, um, with the you know the humanities interpretive exhibit, that could be fundable. I would encourage you to reach out to me and we can chat about that more and see what those objects are. Okay, and um, along that line, can the award um, be used to provide cash prizes? Say, if we're with the example of um, the poetry, if you have a competition, could that be awarded to the winner of a competition, um, which includes analysis and discussion as part of the overall program? Right, so unfortunately, um, funds that are seen as award funds or scholarships or anything of that nature could not be used uh, with the requested funds. That would have to be recorded as cost share. So our funds have to go directly to the implementation of the public humanities programming. Okay, and there are a couple questions about, um, I guess the, the education and how we're looking at that through the humanities lens. So there is a question about environmental education, is that considered part of the humanities, such as teaching um, the community how to interact with their local environment and wildlife um, as part of public educational programming? That's a really good question. And environmental humanities is a rather new discipline in the humanities, which is something that a lot of humanities councils are having to, to come to terms with. So we see um, environmental humanities as different than environmental science, is that is there conversation rooted in how the humanity is just you know impacted by the environment or humans impact the environment or vice versa um, if it is just about uh, biology or um, you know wildlife biology wildlife sciences environmental sciences that would not classify as the humanities um, and typically you know if it's environmental humanities do you have perhaps um, a professor of anthropology or a professor of history involved with your project that's helping to bring out those elements of humanity and human nature within your programming. So environmental projects could be related to the humanities, um, but not all of them are. That feeds into another question along that. If we're teaching um, the community or like youth specifically about the history and heritage, which is human focused about their local community, um, is that considered a humanities project? And within that, if you are helping um, with travel to those sites, if you may be bringing a group or um, is that qualified for use of funds? Uh, yes, yeah. so if you're providing an educational programming, talking about the local history of a community, um, maybe you have a, it's a walking tour or something of that nature, that does qual qualify as a public humanities programming. 
The key here is that this programming has to be available to the general public. And a good indicator of that is if you submit an event listing form and we post it on our website or share it in our newsletter, would we be able to invite anybody to attend across the state of Florida? If the answer is no, and you just wanna have your event for a specific class, um, maybe a, you know, a K through 12 grade, then that would not classify as public humanities programming. Okay, great. Um, can Florida, uh, Florida Talks be used in conjunction with communi the community grant? Community Good question. Grant. Um, again, there, um, the programs should not double dip between the different funding opportunities that we have. So, um, you know, if you apply for $1,000, your Florida Talks grant should be its own project, and the community project grant then should be its own project as well, separate from each other. Okay. Um, and that, I think there was another similar question. If you, I have two potential projects, can I apply for both of my projects and see which one works out? Or That's a really good question. Out? So no, um, your organization can only submit one grant application at a time through each cycle. Um, so if you have five different project ideas and you are just have brimming with ideas for public programming, uh, pick the best one, reach out to me, we can have a conversation and see which one would maybe be the best and most successful chance of getting through our system. Um, but you can only submit one application per deadline from your organization. Okay, um, this is a good question. I think we've seen this a lot, Lindsay, with people asking about virtual events specifically. Do virtual events that have a wide reach fit into the Florida centric priority for Florida humanities? And I think it could expand into does that virtual versus in person have any, did either one have heavier weight when evaluators are looking at applications? Right. So the answer is no, neither have more weight than the other. Uh, we fund programs that are entirely in person, that are entirely virtual, or a hybrid of the two. Um, it is a, a live streamed in person event. So we weigh those all the same. Uh, the important thing is the impact of the project and how it is grounded in the humanities. Um, so, and yeah, so there, there is no, um, no specific weight between the two of those. And I will also say too, um, our grant program is able to be flexible. So if you apply for funding to support an in-person event, um, but things shift and change in the next year and you have to move it to virtual, we have a contract change request form um, that we make available to all of our awardees. So you can just submit our change request saying, hey, COVID has a spike in my community or you know, something happened to this nature and we need to move it to virtual. Um, is that allowable? Yes, and we just need to approve it at least two weeks in advance, and then you can move forward with your project. Um, and similarly, if you request funding for honoraria for people and travel per diem, but your budget is going to change then because maybe a speaker um, canceled or you need to move to that virtual realm so you don't need those in-person facilities and travel costs, that can be uh, changed as well through that contract change request form. We just have to approve it in advance because what we don't want to happen is you change your project um, and change your budget without us knowing you get to the final report and we'll all, we'll have to say, oh shoot, unfortunately we can't cover those funds because those aren't permissible through this grant um, or through the federal government. So it helps protect you um, with your programming as well as us if you just submit your programmatic and budgetary changes in advance. And I believe I didn't answer fully the question about the virtual. So if you have a virtual project that reaches the entire uh, nation, it is a really impactful programming, for example, on civics and democracy, that can be fundable through Florida Humanities. What we just like to see is, is there a connection to Florida or Floridians in some way? Um, and that can easily be done if you're bringing in a humanity scholar, they can tie it to something that's happening in the local community. Okay. We have um, a good question about applying. Um, in order to register for a plot to, in order to register to apply, it's asking for a DUNS number and I can't move forward without that. It's a mandatory field. What should I do? Because our nonprofit doesn't have a DUNS number. Mm. So you have to have a DUNS number, unfortunately, to apply. That is one of our requirements. That is a requirement that is passed down to us from the federal government. Um, the good news is that you can get a DUNS number for free through DUNS, uh, Duns and Bradstreet, I believe it is. Um, so your organization should start the process now of getting a DUNS number for your organization. Do you know how long that takes, Lindsay, if you have to go through and apply for a DUNS number? I do not. That is a good question. Um, I've never done that personally myself, but 
Yeah. I'm not sure. It may take up to a month. So I would just recommend any applicant who does not have a dunce number just to start that process. Okay. Um, we have a question that is specific to greater good, which is a different grant, um, but it's been submitted anonymously. So I think we could address it. Sure, um, let's address it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the question is with greater good, which greater good humanities and academia, that is a grant specifically for universities and colleges in the state of Florida. Um, under that grant, uh, not the university, but there is, we've allowed one um, application per department. Is that going to impact the decision? Is it truly one per organization as we are asking for with community project grants? Right, so community project grants are, um, are different here. Um, so with, with greater good, uh, different departments can apply for that same opportunity since we classify uh, departments within universities and colleges to be their own separate organization since they kind of uh, really act that way. So that makes that grant program a little bit unique. So yes. And if you have any other questions specifically for greater good, if you're from a university or college, please reach out to us. We're happy to, to jump on a call with you or answer specific questions about that more in depth. Um, and then I think there was one that came through the, I think there's something in the chat. Um, yeah, and this was a good one. Is it possible to host series in different panels in multiple programmatic priority areas? For example, could one panel be focused on civics and democracy and the other be immigrant stories? Or do um, we have to select one? <laughs> and I think we've seen that a lot with, is it one program? Are they all individual programs or is it a series? Yep, and that's where the, the creative nature of community project grants come forth. These funds, these fund your projects and your, your, your initiatives that you have. So if you have a 10 lecture series and each lecture focus on something entirely different, but they're all grounded in the humanities, maybe one is a analysis of poetry, maybe one is about, um, you know, civics and democracy and, you know, political, you know, science, other ones about history, that is fine. It doesn't have to be involved with the same theme throughout. Okay. Um, and then there was a question that came through. I think this is really similar along that line. There's a community foundation that works with over 150 local nonprofit organizations, and they're thinking about hosting a Heritage Month speaker series of local community leaders of nonprofit organizations. Um, so does that have to be, would that be categorized as humanities or do local community leaders, subject area experts count as approved humanities advisors? So if the community leaders are not humanities scholars, then they would not classify as, um, as an advisor, as a scholar, they would classify as community experts. So we would encourage you to bring in an external humanities scholar that maybe helps advise, work with each of those different community experts on their programming. Um, you know, maybe you have one for all of them that helps to guide it. If they're gonna be talking about different topics each time, I would recommend actually a different humanities scholar that can specifically address and is qualified to address the different topics from each of those presentations. And we've seen that, I think that question come through on a couple of different grants, but it's also, you don't have to have that scholar be in every part of the project. Like they don't have to come and facilitate questions if you really want the conversation to be focused on that community expert, but they could advise kind of questions or crafting what that presentation will look like in the behind the scenes kind of look. Yep, exactly, exactly. Um, for new applicants, uh, somebody just made a comment that if you are a new applicant and probably if you're applying for that DUNS number, you also will need to register with SAM, SAM.gov um, mm -hmm. as well. And you could speak more to that, Lindsay, but that will be one of the things that will be it has to be approved right before it can be processed. Yes. So SAM.gov, you'll see that in the guidelines. Um, so the SAM.gov is the federal government's system to make sure your organization is in good standing to, in order to receive federal funding. So the only thing you need at the time of application is a DUNS number. Um, but if you are awarded funding, your organization must eventually be registered in SAM.gov uh, before you seek your initial funding. So if you're asking for 90%, we will go on in on our end to look on sam.gov to make sure your organization is registered. Um, and if you're not, we'll send you a little note saying, hey, you guys need to register. So we're going to hold your cash request until your organization is up and live in sam.gov. Um, a note on sam.gov, it is easy. It is, um, it's sometimes easy to register. Sometimes people have issues, but it's free to register and it is free to seek help. 
Um, I had an issue with SAM.gov on our end of checking, and I had to do the same process that many of you have done uh, to call them directly. And I think I had about three different phone calls. They answered my questions though. And so they, they do have a helpline if you get stuck um, as well as some webinars and a really great how-to uh, webpage. And we had another comment along that, but it can be a long process to work through. It does take some time, even if you're renewing, but that um, shouldn't be a barrier from you applying. Uh, if you have the other things in order, then apply. And that's a process. Like as, as Lindsay said, it's a free to apply process. So yeah, we'll see that working through. Yeah. So if you are interested in applying, I encourage you to start the SAM.gov process now, um, just so that when it gets to December 1, your organization will be up and hopefully live in SAM.gov so you can receive your funding as soon as possible. And that looks like um, all of our questions that have been submitted, and they were great questions. I think we covered yeah. a lot of common questions that we get and then some really specific ones as well. Absolutely. No, this, yeah, really good conversation. And we really appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, hope this was very beneficial for you all as well as you're looking to apply for community project grants or learn a little more about what Florida Humanities is and what we do. Um, after this webinar, I will be sending out the recording this afternoon as well as a link to a survey. So we'd love to hear what you think um, about these webinars, what you would like to see in the future. Um, and, uh, and thank you all very much for joining. And we hope we have a, a good rest of your Friday and a very good weekend.